Okay. So, uh, afternoon. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, pick up where we left off. So, we are done with pretty much all of what we had intended for day four, with the exception of this session on high frequency packaging. I'm going to put up a few slides in that. It's not so much packaging as just some high frequency circuit rules. Okay. Again, uh, it's mostly aimed at the mechanical engineering students. Uh, but again, you've seen this in your circuit courses, just refresher, okay? Okay. So, uh, the real problem, of course, is noise. Noise, crosstalks, at high frequency, you've got uh, all of those issues you have to worry about. So, you've got uh, parasitic uh, capacitances, parasitic inductances in your circuitry, and uh, you have to minimize the noise and signal distortions from that. Uh, so, uh, every, in a high frequency circuit, all of the signal paths that, that uh, you have to deal with, signal paths from driver circuit to receiver circuit, supply and ground connections, uh, all of those connections are where these guidelines, design rules have to be used. And uh, by noise, we pretty much mean any distortion in your signal coming from any parasitic react reactances, uh, reflections, so uh, unmatched impedances at, uh, at uh, terminations, so that causes reflections. Uh, simultaneous switching noise, if you have multiple uh, devices being turned on in the same part of the circuitry, you've got a delta I noise there. Uh, crosstalk and uh, uh, EMI. So we won't talk about EMI in any quantitative sense, that's susceptibility and radiation. I'll just qualitatively talk a little bit about it. But it turns out that you can do a little bit of calculation, circuit calculations for some of the rest of the terms. And again, we won't have time to go through all of these. We'll look at a few of these, okay? So just some, uh, sorry, just some basic concepts. Uh, just termino sorry, terminology first. Uh, so those are your sources. They, uh, these are the DC and the AC voltage sources and DC and AC current sources. So the I and the V has been spelt out there. And the passives, you've got resistors, inductors, capacitors, and uh, conductance, okay? So, uh, uh, so those are the basic symbols. Re uh, algebraic relationship between voltage and current over here. Uh, resistor is just the proportionality, so this is a dissipative uh, element. Then uh, inductors, voltage is related to the gradient of current, and capacitor, current is related to the voltage of, uh, uh, gradient of voltage. Not gradient, uh, derivative of voltage, sorry. So basic definitions, and then based on that, you can uh, look at what the impedances look like. So for uh, resistance, the impedance is just, just the resistor itself. For uh, inductance and capacitance, as you know, it's a complex quantity, or it has the square root of minus one J in it. And if you look at the units, so this is frequency, so if you are cycling at a harmonic frequency, omega, radians per second, then uh, you can find the complex uh, impedances with these relationships. And if you look at the units, uh, it turns out inductance, which is in Henry's, so, uh, well, uh, V is volts, C is coulombs, and S is seconds, so resistance has this unit, just the ratio of voltage to current. Then uh, inductance is, uh, got an extra S in it because it's related to the derivative, and capacitance uh, uh, is missing a S because uh, it's the other way around, okay? All right, so, uh, uh, and then if you look at the impedances, re resistor obviously a constant impedance, not a function of frequency. Uh, inductance, the impedance is growing linearly with frequency on the horizontal axis of frequency, and the capacitor is dropping uh, with frequency, okay? inversely proportional. And then all the standard rules apply. So you've got uh, impedances in series, impedances in parallel, uh, okay, impedances in parallel. So these are the standard relationships, same as the thermal circuits that uh, Anand Rup talked about. I'm not gonna waste time on these. So same with mechanical springs, same with uh, thermal resistors, uh, they all work similarly. Now capacitor, of course, uh, I don't have that here. Capacitors uh, are the opposite of, uh, of the way resistors will add. So resistors in series add, uh, capacitors in series add like resistors in parallel. 
and vice versa. Okay. Uh, and then we talk about a sheet resistance. So that's also a useful definition. That's, uh, so that's uh, rho L over A is the standard uh, resi resistance of a conductor. Uh, so L is the length, A is the cross-sectional area. And we also define a sheet resistance rho S. So if the cross-sectional area is W times T, then if you absorb the T in the rho S, then uh, that gives you a sheet resistance. So that's ohms per square unit. This is an important high frequency uh, uh, concept. So again, you've probably seen that in your circuit uh, classes before. So the so-called skin effect at high frequency, it's well understood that the, well, at low frequency, the entire cross section is being used to transfer your signal, to transfer your electrons. At high frequency, there's crowding at the uh, perimeter of the trace and uh, the center part is not being used. So that's the skin and that's the so-called skin effect and the depth of the skin, there are some simple relations to estimate the depth of the skin. So uh, rho is the resistivity of the conducting material. Uh, mu is the uh, permitted free, free space permittivity. And F is the uh, frequency. Uh, sorry, there's no W here. F is the frequency in hertz. So if you take a very simple example. Oh, and the definition, by the way, of delta S is it's the depth at which the current density has dropped by 37 to 37% of the, of the value at the surface. Okay, that's the cutoff point for defining the skin. Okay, uh, so if you take a very simple example, so uh, aluminum at 10 megahertz, so aluminum has a resistivity of 2.7 at 10 to the minus six. Now it's a matter of just plugging that in and you can get a rough idea of what the, so plug in rho, plug in the F of 10 megahertz here, and you'll end up with a value of about uh, uh, 26, uh, sorry, 260 microns, okay? So it's about 260 micron uh, uh, skin depth. So if you have a much bigger trace, all you're utilizing of it is just 260 micron depth of it. The rest of it is not being used. Okay, uh, other issues, circuit delay. We talked a lot about that and uh, some of those equations I'll revisit. Now we had some errors in the equations we'll revisit. But the basic concept is uh, spelled out here, and then I'll go back to that specific geometry that uh, we tried three days back, and there were some errors in that. Not errors, I didn't spell out all the assumptions correctly, so I'll, I'll do that today, okay? Um, okay, so over here, it's, uh, the basic equation is very simple. You, if you just look at the voltage drop across each of these, so sum up all the voltages, and uh, uh, write the VC by, uh, 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 sorry, write the uh, VI, by its relationship, okay? Then uh, you can uh, get a very simple first order differential equation for VC. Uh, that's a voltage across the capacitor. You get a very simple relationship and then you can solve that. It's a simple first order uh, OD, VC here, DV, uh, VC dot here. So the solution to that is well understood in the uh, in math uh, textbooks. It's an exponential decay equation with that time constant tau, which is RC. This is this is the tau factor RC. So that's, uh, if you look at the units that has units of time, R is uh, Vs over C, C is just coulombs over V, so that cancels out to just units of seconds. So that's often called the time constant of that circuit. And uh, so if you look at a plot of that equation, so uh, uh, let's say you're applying a VI, a step, U is just a step function, okay? So, if, uh, so this is a signal uh, step of amplitude A, then uh, that A is gonna be the VI here. So that's A over there and uh, exponential uh, change. So the circuit will exponentially approach value A and that's the delay you're seeing in the beginning, right? So, uh, okay. Um, then you can get a little more sophisticated with that. You can add in, uh, so this is just RC, resistor capacitor. Then you can add in, throw in a, uh, impedance also in it. Now that has its own derivative relationship, right? Differential relationship. So now what happens is you end up with the second order because you've got a DIDT here and a DVDT, <coughs> DVDT from there. So when you combine all that, I'm skipping all the steps obviously in the interest of time, but when you combine those, you end up this time with a second order differential equation. Here you had a first order, here you have a second order. So the solution of a second order is gonna be a little bit different, but again, those have been solved many, many times in the literature. 
So I'm not going to solve it from scratch here for you. Let's look at the nature of the solution. So it turns out you either get an oscillatory solution or an exponential type solution. Depends on the value of uh, L over C. So uh, uh, under damp would be when uh, L over C is uh, greater than half of R. Okay, square, well, square root of L over C is uh, greater than half, half of R. Then you get an under damp circuit. So just like in mechanical vibration circuits. So if you don't have enough damping in the system, then you have uh, oscillatory solution. And if you have, so you're applying a step excitation, uh, you'll get an oscillatory solution settling in eventually into that uh, uh, input that you gave. Under dam uh, critically damped would not oscillate anymore. It would uh, asymptotically approach that solution. And over damped will do the same thing, except it'll take longer to settle, that's all, okay? So, so these solutions are well known in the literature, that's why I'm not putting them up over here. We'll look at the nature of the solution in a minute, but I'm not deriving anything here, okay? Okay, so, uh, so these are all for lumped circuit. That means you are saying that whatever my line impedance is, I can just model that as just a single lumped value, okay? Whatever, whatever my line capacitance and load capacitance is, I can model that as a single lumped value, and same with the resistance. And that works fine as long as the wavelength of the signal you're transmitting is well in excess of your interconnect length. But no, then when it starts to approach the interconnect length, when your signal free, uh, wavelength is starting to approach the interconnect length, you can't make simple approximations, lump parameter approximations anymore, because now you have to consider portions of the trace where the, uh, of the order of the wavelength of the signal that you're transmitting. So now you have to treat it as a distributed system so, and that's uh, well understood. So, uh, in transmission line theory, and I'll c go backwards in a second, in transmission line theory, you basically split up your circuit length into increments, d delta x or dx increments, and you model the parameters of that increment, then you add to that the next dx increment, and so on, so you're considering a distributed system. We'll come back to that. So, let's back up here. Uh, and this is basically what it says, that at low frequencies, when your wavelength is very high, uh, you really don't uh, care about, I mean, you can easily make the lump parameter approximation, uh, but at very high frequencies, that's no longer possible. Now you have to consider the portion of this uh, interconnect that's off the length scale of your wavelength, and that's why you're doing a distributed uh, uh, calculation, and that's called transmission line uh, theory. Okay, and it becomes important whenever your rise time, okay, so if you're going to launch a signal into your circuit, and your rise time. Rise time is defined as the time taken to go from 0.10% to 90% of the saturated value. So if your rise time is, uh, so you would compare that to the time delay of your circuit. So time delay means we are looking at parameters like this, okay? So RC. So if they're comparable, okay? So if the rise time of the signal that you're launching into your interconnect, if they're comparable, then uh, uh, you need a transmission line model. If it's uh, much greater, the rise time is much greater, that means it's a slow signal compared to your time delay, then uh, you can get away with a lumped uh, parameter model. In between, between 2.5 and 5, it's, you know, you, it, it's an approximation that you sometimes can live with, sometimes not. That's what they mean by gray area. I'll also use this bandwidth, this term bandwidth in the next slide, so that's just def de defined over here. It's 0.35 divided by the rise time is being defined as bandwidth. I'll use that in the next slide, so that's why I defined it here. Okay, uh, so the rough guideline is that uh, if the length of the interconnect exceeds uh, lambda over eight, then you have to use transmission line theory. And what is lambda? Uh, lambda, this is the equation for lambda. This is the dielectric constant, okay? Uh, this is just speed of light. This is sort of a quality factor almost always, for most approximate first order calculations, we just use a factor of two over there. And this is the bandwidth, this is the rise time, okay? This 0.35 uh, uh, over TR is in this bandwidth. So if you substitute that expression for bandwidth over here and just simplify your numbers, uh, use three times 10 to the power eight for C and so on, it basically boils down to an equation like this. So the lambda is a function of the rise time and the dielectric constants so uh, that dielectric constant in turn is related to L and C, right? Uh, so uh, that's, that's what basically gives you uh, the guideline 
uh, for lambda, and then any time the length of the interconnect is uh, more than uh, one eighth of that value, you have to uh, you have to use uh, you're better off using transmission line theory. You cannot do lump circuit approximation. And this is where the transmission line theory derivations are set up. Once again, uh, there's a inductance per unit length, there's a uh, resistance per unit length, capacitance per unit length, and conductance per unit length. Okay. So if you set up all the equations, you again once again get a second order differential equation. And you do a Fourier transform. That means you're trying to solve that in uh, frequency space. Okay. Uh, so with that Fourier transform, you end up with, in frequency space, you end up with this kind of a solution. So this is the spatial variation. But you can see that you've got expressions in terms of frequency over here, uh, j omegas over here and here. And that gives you the, that's the second order expression for v as a function of x. And again, those are been solved years and years ago back in the literature. So you make uh, exponential approximations, a negative lambda x and a positive lambda x for a forward and reverse wave. Okay, and if you, where the lambda turns out to be square root of this quantity, that, oops, square root of that quantity. Okay, so, uh, uh, so that basically turns out, and then you, so that's the spatial variation, and then you go back and multiply by the temporal variation that you had done in your Fourier transform, right? Uh, so that becomes a lambda x and a jwt. So that's just lambda x and jwt, lambda x and jwt, uh, the negative for the forward wave and the positive for the reverse wave. Uh, and same way, just as you got the velocity, uh, by voltage, you can also get the current, and that uh, this ends up being the expression for the current. Where z naught, the impedance, is just this ratio. Again, it's closely related to those exponents, um, those coefficients. Okay, so that's just the uh, uh, impedance characteristic impedance, and works out if you work out the units, it works out in ohms. So, in particular, a lot of circuits, the r and the g are oftentimes pretty low. So, if that happens, then there are no lossy elements, no dissipative elements. Uh, all you're left with is L and C, so that would be an approximate, approximately speaking, a lossless transmission line. And there the math is a little bit simpler, so the Z naught simplifies, so this is gone, R and G are gone, J omega cancels out, you just get square root L over C, so uh, the characteristic impedance is just square root L over C. L U and C U are per unit length, okay? Okay, um, let's move on here. So the signal velocity is of importance. The signal velocity is given by C naught over square root epsilon r, and epsilon r is just a function of L u and C u and C naught, so you can write it in either form, 1 over square root L c or C divided by square root epsilon r. They both give you the same answer. C naught is, of course, velocity of light, 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. So if you look at a few materials, just to get a feel for some numbers, if you look at some standard dielectric materials that we've been talking about last few days, ceramics, FR4, silicon dioxide, polyimids. Uh, these are the kinds of dielectric constants they have. So using that speed of light, you can calculate some estimates some velocities, 16 to 20 uh, uh, meters per, uh, 10 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second, uh, down to about 10, okay? And the corresponding time delay going through that circuit would be the length of the so uh, length of the uh, interconnect divided by that velocity. So as an example, if you want to know what's the time taken to go through an FR4 trace, that's about five inches long. So that's just conversion five into metric. 2.54 is the conversion. And the velocity for FR4 is 13. Substitute 13, that's about a nanosecond. So it takes about one nanosecond to go from uh, one end of another for five inch trace which, by the way, is not an insignificant number when you talk about high-frequency circuits, okay? Uh, so the whole point is we need to be able to come up with these Z-naughts, the impedances, okay? So this impedance is important for different uh, uh, characteristic uh, circuit elements. So uh, uh, in other words, you have to be able to estimate square root L over C for different form factors. And uh, the handbooks, WE handbooks, have many such configurations. So you can see for coaxial cables, people have derived the relationships. It's uh, 60 over square root epsilon r. And this is d over d is uh, 
the, the diameter of uh, uh, the inner, di inner uh, dielectric, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's the diameter of the inner dielectric divided by the diameter of the inner conductor, okay. Uh, for par two parallel strips that are running side by side, there are similar relationships. D is the separation, W is the uh, uh, strip width. So you're looking at, you're basically looking at this geometry, long in this direction. So this is uh, W, and that is, sorry, that is B. And these are, by the way, approximate relationships. The real relationships get to be a little more complex, okay? These are approximate relationships. And uh, then there are more complex geometries because these are the configurations you run into in circ real circuit cards. So this would be a trace on top of a circuit card with a ground plane below it, okay? So that's so-called microstrip model. And these are all, by the way, uh, not, they're these approximate relationships, okay? So people tend to solve these numerically, get very complex uh, expressions, and then fit simpler forms to that, those complex expressions. So these are basically simple expressions for closed form design calculations that have been fit to these. And there are various forms of these, by the way. If you look at uh, different EE handbooks, you find other forms of these expressions also. So these are just approximate expressions that people have derived to fit to the actual results. And the actual results can be numerically obtained. Uh, so I'm not going to go through the details. You can see these are clearly some kind of semi-empirical kind of uh, expressions. But they're all in terms of the geometry and material properties. The geometry means the trace dimensions, the distance to the ground plane, then the dielectric constants, okay? So uh, uh, the dielectric constant of the dielectric material. So this is a surface microstrip. This is an embedded microstrip. So this is a buried layer, buried trace uh, below a circuit card surface. And then there are strip line theories. If you have two different ground planes and uh, so multi-level circuit card, two different ground planes, traces buried in between them, then again, there are some simple expressions that people have used. Once again, if you look up handbooks, and these are, by the way, on the web, you can just find calculators. You don't even need to know the equation. You plug in these values and the calculators produce the results. So uh, all of them are available in the public domain. You just need to recognize which of these configurations you are trying to model so you can pull up the right uh, uh, calculator for it. And the rough approximations are given over here. Okay. Um, so uh, a couple of, couple of uh, guidelines that people use, coplanar waveguides. So for example, if you have a trace here that has two other traces at ground potential next to them and a ground plane, uh, then, uh, uh, th and this is where the signal is being transmitted, so that's your waveguide. So uh, the guideline is that if you have that kind of a microstrip model, uh, you should put in ground traces next to them if possible, and in addition, ground vias if possible, they call it a fence, via fence. So you put in two ground traces and uh, uh, via fences around them to isolate those traces and minimize uh, electrical noise and so on. Okay, um, then there's termination issues. So termination reflections, okay, so if there's an impedance mismatch, so if you have a conductor that's ending here and there's something else on the other side, uh, so there's an impedance mismatch, two different materials on two sides of that interface, Z1 and Z2, then the reflection coefficient is given by the mismatch of the impedances. So for example, if it's completely open, Z2 is zero on the other side, then that uh, reflection coefficient goes to one. A short circuit, if uh, uh, both of them are the, sorry, match circuit, both of them are the same value, it goes to zero, and short circuit goes to minus one, okay? Okay, um, let's skip over these. Yeah, let's uh, talk about, the next interesting thing to talk about would be, I'll skip over these, and uh, these are just, so uh, for power distribution uh, calculations, they do uh, inductance calculation, a power distribution inductance calculation, and that is a function of the L effective in that calculation is uh, uh, the self-impedance of the line, okay, so the self-impedance of going up and down that line, and the mutual inductance between these two. So that concept is also important, so you need to, sorry, 
you need to be able to estimate the self-inductance. So for a straight wire, that's the self-inductance. And then you, since you have the mutual inductance, because these two are in close proximity, there's a mutual inductance getting uh, superposed on that effective length effective. Uh, so you also have to estimate the mutual inductance. Again, there are expressions in handbooks, electrical handbooks for all of that. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, similar calculations, not just for parallel wires, but wire above a plane, parallel planes. So the inductance calculations available for all of those. Okay, uh, switching noise. So uh, with that L effective, you can actually estimate the switching noise. So if you have the current changing, because each time you close the switch on these PMOSs, especially if you have multiple PMOSs on your circuit, uh, that's sudden change on the current that's going to flow through. So based on the DIDT, you're going to have some jumps or spikes in the voltage. That's what we are referring to as uh, simultaneous switching noise. And uh, the L effective, we just talked about how to calculate them with uh, uh, self and mutual inductances. So especially if the speed goes high, DIDT, that means you've got a rapid switch, then you can see that the voltage spike is proportional to the rate of change of that current. So in high frequency switching, uh, you start to get significant amount of uh, switching noise. That's why uh, being able to estimate that is important. Okay? And basically what you would have to do is to lower those inductances to lower that voltage spike. So you'd have to design the circuit to minimize those inductances. Okay, let's skip over some of these. So these are decoupling capacitors. So again, to minimize that kind of noise, you put in these uh, multiple decoupling capacitors. So each time you have a PMOS, you put in a decoupling capacitor. And then you would uh, pick the capacitors based on what the frequency you're trying to isolate from, what's the frequency at which you're switching. You would pick capacitors, the right capacitors for that frequency range. And there are some guidelines here. What frequent, what capacitor values would you use at what frequency range? Okay. Okay, and this is just some pictures of where those decoupling capacitors are usually put in. Okay, finally, uh, crosstalk. So there's no calculations we're going to do over here. Just, uh, just, uh, uh, just some terminology. So when you have uh, uh, traces in proximity or uh, conductors in proximity, the signal on one line will, of course, induce a, a, a signal in the, in the next one, uh, induction effect. It'll uh, uh, induce its own field, and that'll produce a signal in the second one, and that is what is commonly referred to as crosstalk. So you'd want to move your traces further away or increase the coupling to ground planes. That's what minimizes that field uh, interaction and uh, minimizes the crosstalk. Uh, you would put in uh, uh, grounded traces in between if you can, okay, between the two traces that you're trying to isolate from each other. The length is important, so you try to minimize the length over which they're going to run parallel to each other. And of course, the frequency, the rise and fall time of the signal will also uh, 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 control the magnitude of the crosstalk. So that's it, just a few terminology and basic concepts in high frequency circuitry, okay? Uh, translates into, in packaging guidelines, it translates into how you're going to design your circuitry, where are you going to put in isolators, where are you going to put in decoupling capacitors, where are you going to put in ground planes relative to uh, your traces, what's the maximum length you can make your traces run parallel to each other at different frequencies before you start to have significant noise and crosstalk. So that's what these equations are basically used for. Okay. Uh, Good, five o'clock. So now let's move to, uh, how much longer can we go today? Maybe 5.30. 5.30, okay. So I'll start off the next, which is actually supposed to be tomorrow. So let's open, reopen that. Uh, so uh, tomorrow we, all day, we talk about reliability aspects, life cycle issues. So I'm going to, th the first one is just introductory, okay? So I'll just start off the first one. Uh, just some general concepts, and some of the, these actually we talked about in the first day in the, in the introduction and overview session. We'll revisit some of that, so we'll be ready for the DFR course, uh, DFR session tomorrow, okay? So for that, this though, I don't think I've transferred the file yet, so I gotta grab it here. Give me a minute. 